Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we're talking about the QRS complex in the ECG and how to analyze the actual complex. We spoke about the QRS axis before, so now we're talking about the actual morphology of the complex, how to analyze that and what it actually means. So we spoke about a QRS complex that is narrow versus one that is wide. And you'll remember that narrow means a QRS complex less than 110 milliseconds. Or if you want to be simple about it, just three small blocks, so less than 120 milliseconds. And we said that narrow QRS complexes have the original impulse located in the atria. So it's an atrial rhythm or a supraventricular rhythm. And wide complex QRS complexes have a ventricular rhythm or a supraventricular rhythm with a conduction block. Right? Remember we spoke about that before in the video on tachycardias. So today we're going to talk about the actual morphology of the QRS complex in all its parts and we're going to start with the Q wave. Right? Now if you don't remember what a Q wave is, at the end of the PR interval you'll either see a downstroke or an upstroke as the QRS complex starts. If you see a downstroke that's called a Q wave. And the important thing about Q waves is something called pathological Q waves. Pathological Q waves are Q waves that are more than 25% of the total amplitude of the QRS complex. And if you see a pathological Q wave, you should be concerned because a pathological Q wave is the best marker on an ECG for diagnosing ischemic heart disease. So if you see a Q wave that goes more than 25% of the total amplitude of the QRS complex, that's a pathological Q wave. And you should start looking for either signs on the patient's history or other ECG signs of ischemic heart disease. Then we get to the R wave. Right? Now the R wave is that first upstroke in the QRS complex. Now we have something called R wave progression. Now R wave progression refers to the pattern of the R waves between V1 and V6. Now from V1 to V4, you should have an increase in the amplitude of the R wave. And we call that R wave progression. So between V4, 5 and 6, your R wave should be at its peak. Now if you've got an abnormal R wave progression, that could mean a few things. Right? Number one, you could either have an abnormally high R wave in V1 and V2, so your R wave progression does not look that much, or you can have an abnormally low amplitude R wave in V4, V5, and V6. And you have to differentiate between the two because they are markers of different diseases. So if you've got a prominent R wave in V1 and V2, the causes of that are most likely a right bundle branch block, right ventricular hypertrophy, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, or a posterior myocardial infarction. So it's those four, right bundle branch block, RV hypertrophy, posterior MI, or Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. That'll give you an abnormally large R wave in V1 and V2, so your R wave progression will be poor. Then, if you've got poor R wave progression from V1 to V4, you're looking at different causes. And the causes you're looking at here are ischemic heart disease and pericardial effusions. So if you've got a low R wave that progresses and does not increase in amplitude, you are looking at pericardial effusion or ischemic heart disease as a cause of poor R wave progression. So the next thing you want to look at with your R waves is you want to look at the heights of the R waves. And specifically, you are looking for left ventricular hypertrophy here. So what you do is you take V1 and V6 and you measure the two R waves and you add the two. So you take the height of V1 plus the height of V6. If those two R waves measure more than seven blocks when you add them together, that is a sign of left ventricular hypertrophy. And the same thing for V2 and V5. If you add V2 and V5's R waves and the amplitude is more than seven blocks, that is a sign of left ventricular hypertrophy. So if you guys didn't know by now, one of the new things coming is that we're actually launching the website for the Helper Medic in the next few days. So I've put a link down in the description where you can subscribe to the newsletter because one of the things we can do on the website is you'll be the first to know about any new projects that I'm doing on the Helper Medic 
and any new initiatives like blog posts or helpful tips. Part of what's happening on the website is that I'm going to be launching my new ebook, the complete ECG guide step by step for medical students. So make sure you leave a comment down below because one of the people that comments on this video what your favorite specialty in medicine is or what your least favorite specialty in medicine is will win a free copy of the ebook that I'm launching for ECGs. And one more thing to discuss when looking at the QRS complex, but it's more at an ECG as a whole, is how to diagnose pulmonary hypertension on an ECG. And the first thing you're going to look for is P pulmonale. Remember we spoke about that, the peaked P wave, as well as when we spoke about the QRS axis, right axis deviation, because one of the causes is pulmonary hypertension. And the last thing you're going to look for is a high R wave in V1 and V2, because either a right bundle branch block or right ventricular hypertrophy because of the pulmonary hypertension. So the three things you look for for pulmonary hypertension on an ECG, your P pulmonale, right axis deviation, and poor R wave progression because of an abnormally high R wave in V1 or V2. So the next topic we're going to cover is the ST segment and its relation to ischemic heart disease. In there we're going to talk about what the ST segment shows us, how you measure the different types of ischemic heart disease on an ECG, and how the whole ECG layout relates to ischemic heart disease. How you can tell which part of the heart is affected by what leads are affected on an ECG. That's coming in our next video. Thanks everyone, see you next time.